Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and books that get you talking. Every episode, we sit down to chat about the books read most recently by our book clubs. What did we make of them? Did they spark debate? And whether we love them or loathe them, the big question is always, were they great book club books? This episode, we're discussing The Trouble with Goats and Sheep by Joanna Cannon, which my book club read this past month. It's an atmospheric, pacey novel about suburban secrets set during the British heatwave of 1976. And in our guest book club interview, we hear from Emily Rhodes about her walking book club and how rambling in the wilds of Hampstead Heath and talking about books go hand in hand. When you're out, it's, you can just look at the trees or, you know, a dog running past and it just works. It works really, really well. And I think people love that walking element. So stay tuned. All that, plus our usual recommendations, coming up on the Book Club Review. Here we are again, back in the shed. And keen listeners might possibly be able to hear the sound of my neighbour's children playing outside in the garden. It's a lovely, sunny Sunday afternoon. We're in the back garden, so actually we're shielded from any potentially twitching curtains of my neighbour's. (laughs) <laughs> which all feels very appropriate to discuss The Trouble with Goats and Sheep. Exactly. So The Trouble with Goats and Sheep is by Joanna Cannon. It's her first novel. And last episode, I introduced it as a mystery of sorts. But is it? Things kick off with the disappearance of Mrs. Creasy. It's the summer of 1976, and an epic heat wave is gripping the country, while 10-year-old Grace and her friend Tilly take it upon themselves to find out where Mrs. Creasy has gone. Now, you'd think then that that would be the main thrust of this novel, but that's only true in part. Instead, the two girls' search becomes the setup for this novel's real focus, secrets. Those that the Avenue's cast of characters share, and those they don't. Now, often I say I haven't heard of an author or the book that comes up, but actually this one I was pretty familiar with. It's had quite a lot of press. It's sort of done quite well. It's on the front table when you go into Waterstones. Was that kind of the feeling with your book? I was quite pleased that you brought it up because I was quite curious about it. Yeah, we had to, I, had, I hadn't heard of it, um, but you're right. It's a Richard and Judy book club right now, so it's getting a lot of attention. It's on all the bestseller lists. We had just finished reading Border, and we felt like we needed something a bit more commercial. And actually, it was one of our past guest book club interviews that gave me the idea that everyone should prepare because usually our book club kind of wings it when we make a choice. So I told everyone, okay, can you bring a few ideas about what we should read next? Which was actually terrible because we all we were so indecisive. And we talked about probably 10, 15 books before we could kind of decide what we wanted to read. Yeah. And perhaps more than anything, I think it was maybe fatigue that we went like, The Trouble with Goats and Sheep. Oh, it's a bestseller. Oh, it's a good read. Okay, let's do that. Let's go for that. I'm pleased we did, though. It's quite nice to read something that's on the pulse and out there and getting a lot of attention. Yeah. So I have a slight confession to make at this point, which is that I haven't actually finished it. It's shocking. Uh, (laughs) Isn't it, listeners? It's just just appalling behavior. (laughs) I blame the book. But let's come on to that. (laughs) Um, Actually, in my book club, I like to encourage people to come whether they finished it or not, because I think it's always interesting to have the discussion. And actually, then, you know, you might well be inspired to carry on especially if like me you've been struggling slightly and that's that takes me back to what we were saying about whether or not it's a mystery because you would think that you would be gripped but I agree it wasn't a novel that kind of sucked me in where I was desperate to know what happens it's written in quite a distinctive way do you have a little bit that you want to read just to give us a sense of the author's voice I do so this is an excerpt which is from Mr Creasy's perspective and Mr Creasy does not know where his wife is gone And he has perhaps um, maybe an obsessive compulsive disorder or maybe he's slightly on the autistic spectrum. It's unclear. But his wife was very much his support in life. And so her disappearance is both concerning but has also let him very adrift. He missed her reassurance, the way she stole his disquiet and diluted it, and how her unconcern would pull him through their day. She never dismissed his worries. She just disentangled them, smoothing down the edges and spreading them out until they became thin and insignificant. He missed her conversation, the ease of the words as they ate and the sound of the cutlery resting on a plate. He had tried to carve into the quiet with the television and the radio and the sound of his own voice, but his noise just seemed to grow the silence and make it taller, and it followed him from room to room like water pouring from a glass. So she does have a quite sort of lyrical way that she brings her characters to life, that she describes them, and sometimes that works 
very well and I, I would often be struck by a particular line that I thought was really beautifully expressed. How did your, how did your book club find the writing? One of the things that Francis picked up on is that this is a book where we're told uh, the story from multiple perspectives and it can feel quite bitty and often their phrasing is very striking. There's this, almost these moments, these paragraphs, and I feel like I've just picked one out. And Frances said it just reminds her of any creative writing course. So she, this is Canon's first novel. Mm. It's a little bit formulaic, potentially, that she's, she's gone into her writing class, Frances thought, and gone, here, look at this, I've written this chapter now. And isn't it great? And everyone will probably be like, oh, yes, that's wonderful. And then she stitched them all together around this, um, not elaborate plot, but it is... It, it's a proper plot, isn't it? It's not a, a natural unfolding of events. It's very much constructed. And what Anita said halfway through, you wouldn't you wouldn't know this, but maybe this is a reason not to press onto it. Is Anita was like, I feel like this book had a lobotomy halfway through. It's like the author had to make some things happen, which are fairly bizarre. They include a creosote Jesus. Right. <laughs> you didn't get to the creosote Jesus. No. No. They see there's a creosote stain on the wall in the middle of the heat wave. Oh, like the Turin Shroud. I see. Everyone gathers around this creosote Jesus. Um, and that, therefore, is a meeting place where everyone comes together and secrets and animosities and grudges can kind of spark off each other. But, but strangely, no one goes to work. Over the course of like four or five days, that's what I kept on thinking. I was like, does no one on this avenue work? I know it's the summer. But everyone's just hanging out by the creosote Jesus. Well, the main voice in this book is Grace, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And Grace and Tilly are the characters that you follow most closely. And I actually have pulled out a little bit that I thought was another example of Cannon's beautiful way of writing. Grace talking about her father. She said, my father spent his time stored away in an office on the other side of town and always had to have the day explained to him when he got home. That, that idea of having to have the day explained to him. And I sometimes think perhaps my children think that, you know, when they come home, we're always like, oh, what did you do? How was your day? And they have to explain <laughs> it to us. But sometimes she could be very charming. And I think it, it never made me laugh out loud, but I felt like I could see why some people might find it perhaps funnier than I was finding it. I quite like Grace. She's a bit of a monster. Uh, she really bullies the, the lovely Tilly, who seems to have some sort of, possibly a blood cancer. You're never sure how life-threatening it is, although it does become, again, a bit of a, a plot tool towards the end. But I liked Grace because she, she, you know, she thinks she knows everything. She wants to be just like one of the older girls on the block. And she wants to understand what's happening to the community because everyone's acting so strangely, given Mrs. Creasy's disappearance. One of my problems with it was this... A sense of the drip drip of information and I think you alluded to it earlier but there strangely isn't much of a driving force in this book there's not a real sense of momentum or certainly it never gathered any momentum for me no Mrs Creasy's disappearance is more of a construct than anything else and it allows Grace and Tilly the excuse to pretend they're brownies and go and see their neighbours' homes and kind of pick their minds for the reasons why Mrs. Creasy may have disappeared. But the adult cast of characters, they're much more concerned with their own secrets and the fact that Mrs. Creasy might know them. And now Joanna Cannon, she's a really interesting woman because she dropped, well, she, I guess she didn't drop out of school, but she just finished her O-levels. I'm always confused by the high school system here. You could do O-levels and then A-levels? Yeah. So she probably left school about around 15, 16. And then she worked all sorts of different jobs I think, until she was probably in her late 20s or early 30s. And then she finished her A-levels, went to university and became a doctor, a medical doctor, and eventually specialised in psychiatry. So that's why I think she's so interested in the lives of these individuals and the stories that they don't share with their neighbours. And you've got... Honestly, everyone on this block has a secret. You've got bankruptcy, you've got illiteracy, you've got rape, abortions from the past, you have a missing child. Um, we haven't even mentioned Walter Bishop, who's the kind of local weirdo who lives on the avenue and who all the neighbours are united against as if he's a threat. They think that he might be a paedophile, even though there's, well, he likes children, but he's just kind of a bit of a... He likes children. That sounds bad enough. But that's really the problem is that he, he isn't really able to relate to his neighbours um, and actually feels much more comfortable just chatting to the children in the neighbourhood. But the adults find that very worrisome. And there's this backstory, this history that unites all the neighbours that has to do with a death that happened nine years earlier. So that's sort of working its way out of the woodwork as well. Everyone's talking about it because Mrs Creasy has left and they think that's perhaps why she's gone and what's going to happen if she comes back or has someone killed her. 
But there's no real sense of anything sinister happening. It's more just like, where's she gone? Who knows? Maybe she's off in Spain, someone speculated. Mm. There's a lot of speculating. It's sort of a novel about speculation. I had two problems with it. One was with the sense of time and one was the sense of place. The sense of time, it's incredibly painstakingly specific. There are all of these references to very specific things from this period, the early 70s. The animals that are on Tilly's bedroom shelf, the whimsy collection. Did you know what those were? I did, actually, okay. vaguely. Like it, it was like a long, recessed memory about these little brown ceramic animals. I had to Google them. Or, you know, Angel Delight. Or, had to I Google mean, that as well. Again, it was kind of charming, but I found it more laboured than charming. She sets her street in what she calls an estate, and I was slightly troubled by that. I have a certain association in my mind that comes with the word estate, a housing estate. In the village that I grew up, there was a housing estate. But that was quite a specific place. And I grew up in a little lane. And I don't know, I, I again, I felt like I couldn't really, I, I felt like she was trying to make it every place, a place that people could really relate to no matter where they were from. And strangely, I found the constant reiteration of the fact that there was this estate and the street kind of shut me out a little bit because I couldn't quite imagine what she meant. If she just set the whole book in a cul-de-sac, that would have been enough for me. That's that's the ultimate English suburban thing, a cul-de-sac. That would have done. Uh, I bet you read this on your Kindle, didn't you? Yes. So it is a cul-de-sac. I have a, there's a, the, at the beginning of the book, so I'm just <laughs> showing you my print edition right now. It is, it's called The Avenue, but it is a cul-de-sac. Oh. And I don't understand why. As I was reading it, before I knew where the author was from, I had this sense that it was the Midlands, you know, where I've spent a little bit of time because we go up and visit my in-laws. And the Midlands is at least where I go, which is near Derby, Burton-on-Trent, Litchfield. There's a sense that there's always a bit of high drama going on, similar to this book. And you're right. I think the author wants this to be sort of every town, but there is a sense of specificity that spoke to me because it's a place I have been to or at least very close to and maybe felt a bit more alienating for you because you haven't probably spent much time up there. Well, yeah, I think it just comes back to that sense I had with this book that I really wanted to lose myself in it and the place and the people. And I kept being jolted out of that by the fact that I was just being, I felt like I was being told things all the time. I kept being, I was told that this was an estate and I was told about the angel delight on the table and the ginger nuts and yeah, it's kind of an obsession with biscuits and confectionery <laughs> that just I found kind of mildly irritating. Everything is a little bit heavy handed about this book. Well, a little uh, bit self-conscious. And perhaps this speaks to the fact that she's not primarily an author. She's a psychiatrist. And actually, as a novel by a psychiatrist, it's really um, incredibly impressive. And I'm sure that her next book will be better because she's probably just, you know, she's clearly taking her first steps as a writer and, and doing brilliantly well yeah and it's impossible not to admire that but for me that did really show up and stop me really engaging with this um even from the very beginning when she's establishing her characters and grace she's with tilly and she says why are you wearing a jumper i said tilly always wore a jumper even in scorched heat she would pull it over her fists and make gloves from the sleeves but i thought well if you know tilly always wears a jumper why are you wondering why she's wearing a jumper and asking her? <laughs> and that really troubled me, but it was full of little moments. So I had as many moments where I thought, oh, that's a lovely phrase, or she's expressed that really beautifully, as I had moments of, why are you telling me that? Well, even the hunt for Mrs. Creasy becomes much more complicated than it needs to be. Early on, you probably got to this bit, they go to um, church, as they would on a Sunday, and Grace hears the vicar say that God is everywhere. And so... Suddenly, rather than look for Mrs. Creasy, they decide that they're searching for God, because if they find God, Mrs. Creasy will return. And these aren't that little of girls. You know, they're not six or seven. They're, they're ten. They're ten yeah. So I find it strange that they're suddenly searching for God, which clearly... Well, maybe not clearly. I don't spend enough time with children. But why search for God when you could be searching for Mrs. Creasy? Yeah, I was struck by the God thing. But strangely, actually, I didn't mind that so much. Hmm. I think for children growing up in England, often going to Church of England schools, I think the Church of England, certainly my childhood, you know, it, it looms large. And that didn't worry me so much, even though, like many other things in this book, it's slightly clunky device. It is a bit clunky. But 
with that one, I, I was more willing to go with it. And it does actually tie in with the central idea about goats and sheep, which is a sort of religious... It is. Who knew? Metaphor. <laughs> um, taken from the Bible yes. about dividing up... She does explain that. She does. It comes out, apparently, as the Gospel of Matthew. Right. Yes. And so they're searching for God, but they also encounter this scripture where that God will divide the sheep who have been faithful followers from the goats who lack compassion and empathy and we've pushed aside. And so there's a strange sub-narrative of kind of like Christian kindness. And yet, at the same time, you don't get the sense that Joanna Cannon is Christian herself. Not particularly, no. No. So it's a very... It's a very um, English uh, engagement with Christianity. Yeah. She's not trying to convert anyone. She's yeah. just like, and, and maybe you might remember the the scripture because actually it has some good things to teach us. Yeah, so unlike a lot of other things about this book, I think that was one of the things where the Englishness of it rang true. And I mm. quite liked that. Mm. That worked for me. The other thing I quite liked that perhaps, well, obviously actually must come from her day job as a psychiatrist was that slight sense that everyone on that street has sort of something about them. Oh, yes. Um, you know, everyone. Someone is a little bit OCD. Someone has an alcohol problem. Someone has a problem with food. Someone may have been abused as a child. I thought she wove that in quite nicely and quite naturally. Mm -hmm. But it's almost a checklist. Every time she switches to someone's perspective when, from to an adult's perspective, it's like, and now you shall find out their secret. What did, what did your book club make of that? Were they sort of happy or have your book club in any way supported any of my criticisms? <laughs> well, or my... Am I a lone voice? No, no, my book club was they weren't uh, they weren't big fans. Mm. No, I think the 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 most um the kindest thing anyone said was that it would be a good a beach read. Mm. It, was it a good book club book? That's the question. No. It was it was fine. We had enough to talk about, you know, we're pros. We we come prepared and we're ready to debate and pick things up and uh, you know, we just enjoy having some banter. But I don't think it really gives you enough because it's not a compulsive read. Yeah. You, it's, that's why I don't think it's even a very good beach read, because mm. it's pretty plodding. So there's no, I mean, obviously I'm sort of about halfway through. So do I not even have to bother finishing it? I don't know that you do. I mean, now that you've already let out your, your dirty <laughs> dirty little secret, um, I, I don't know. It's not it's not like there's any great reveal either. As, as we've been saying all along, the secrets are sort of drip fed. Yeah. And I do think there's like a powerful sense of place and the heat and and then the community and the secrets. But mm, you know, you don't you don't love any character. Mm. You don't. The plot doesn't drive you forward. So mm. no, perhaps don't bother. I mean, I, I don't know whether with your book club it felt the same way, but you know, I wanted to like it. I wanted to like it, and I did. I did feel. You know, I think she has got huge potential as a writer. I yeah. think that there are some wonderful, wonderful phrases and. Yeah, almost something a little bit uncanny about the way she describes things and from that passage I read where she says, you know, the silence followed him from room to room mm. like water mm. pouring from a glass. Mm. It's, it's very unusual. Yes. And, I, and I, I thought sometimes she had a capacity for real insight mm. into people and behavior. One character we loved was Eric Lamb, and he is still grieving the death of his wife and he's a gardener and the girls come into his back garden and he's talking to them about weeding plants and what is a weed. And it's it is a bit labored you know this is almost a direct metaphor for their understanding of walter bishop this outsider on their street and the weeds and what is a weed and what is a goat what is a sheep who knows but it is very sweet so i think joanna cannon's one to watch and i'd be curious to know what she writes next i mm. think it'll be good mm. yeah me too so to sum up the trouble with goats and sheep probably not your next book club read but stay tuned we're going to be talking about some other recommendations we have that pick up on some of the themes and plot lines of this book now be honest if you're like laura and me the preferable location for your book club is probably a cozy living room or a kitchen or a nice pub restaurant with a glass of something in your hand but the subject of this week's book club interview does things differently for the past five years emily rhodes has been running a successful walking book club and when i met her on a windy Hampstead heath she put me through my paces as i learned firsthand the joys of walking and talking about books so Emily, here we are on Hampstead Heath in London, walking along beside a large pond. Can you tell anyone who's not from London, who doesn't know London, a little bit about Hampstead Heath? Hampstead Heath is massive and green, and it's probably about as wild as London's parklands get, I'd say. It's a place I've always loved. It sort of makes you feel like you're in the country almost, although you're not. You're right next to a train station. We've just left Daunt Books, which is a very lovely bookshop nearby. What's the connection with you and Daunt? 
So I started working at Daunt's about, oh gosh, seven or eight years ago. And after a few months there, I started running the little daunts up in Belsize Park, which there are actually there are two um, daunts in North London. There's one in Hampstead, right by the Heath, and there's one in Belsize Park, just up the hill. And I was very excited to be sort of running this little shop. And one of the things I really noticed was that a lot of our customers loved Hampstead Heath as much as I did. So I wanted to come up with a way of trying to sort of bring the bookshop onto the heath. So I decided to start a book club which would take place on Hampstead Heath and would involve going for walks. And it was a great success and so Emily's Walking Book Club was born. Okay, so we're just sitting down on a gorgeous spot, the top of a hill. So this is on your walking route, is it? Yeah, so um, we walk for about an hour or thereabouts. We meet at the Daunt Books in Hampstead. That's quite a nice spot to meet because all the books are sort of around and the shop feels all kind of buzzy and full of people and everyone's talking about books. And then you sort of cross the road and enter the heath and you suddenly feel like you're out in the wild. So the idea is you've read the book first and we walk along and I give the group ideas or themes or questions to spark conversations. So we'll have maybe 30, 40 people coming along and instead of all sitting in a circle and one person holding forth and everyone taking it in turns, everyone just talks at once. So you, you instantly split into twos, threes, fours and forge on ahead and after about 10 minutes or so we get to the ponds that we just walked past and I sort of stop everyone catches up I've been sort of flitting about between the different people and try and recap over some of the things that people have said and ideas that have come up in that conversation maybe I'll read a little bit out or get someone else to read a bit out and then start everyone off on a different theme and we come up here get up to the top of Parliament Hill, stop again, <laughs> um, read a bit more out. And, and so we keep going. We probably have about five stops, five or six stops. And it works really well. And there's also a lot of reshuffling. So, you know, although the group's been going for about five years and there are some people who come regularly and have been coming since the beginning, every month there's a couple of new people. And sometimes people come with another person because they're a bit nervous about not knowing anyone else. And initially they just sort of talk to their friend and I slightly firmly kind of make them reshuffle to meet new people because for me what I think is so brilliant about books is that they're a common ground and so you can have all these different people coming to the book club who on the face of it may have nothing in common but they've all read this book and so they can all talk to each other when it started, we didn't get so many people. The first year was quite hit and miss. Once there was only one person and she'd never come before and we had this very intense walk together. Can you remember what the book was? Yeah, I do remember the book. It was by Toby Janssen, this amazing Scandinavian writer who wrote The Moomins. She wrote this book called The True Deceiver and it was about this very intense kind of power struggle between these two women and we walked across this freezing heath trying to talk about this book it was yeah she didn't come back <laughs> unfortunately so, so there were some low points in the early days but most of the people who came were very kind of keen on it and and their enthusiasm kind of kept me going and then it just gathered momentum and yeah we get anything from 20 to I think once we have 50 people and how do you decide what you're going to read most book clubs work on a kind of democratic system, or I'm afraid this is very much a sort of dictatorship. <laughs> um, so many people are telling you to read the current paperback that's just come out, and there are all the reviews, there's all the space in the bookshop, there are ads out, you know, everybody knows about it. But what really interested me as a bookseller and a reader were those books that just looked slightly neglected on the shelf but that the people who knew would come in and ask for them or come in and seek them out. And actually one that really was a good instance of this was this book called West with the Night by Beryl Markham. Do you know that book? No, I've never heard of it. Okay, so I'd never heard of it either. But having worked at Dawn for you know a couple of years, I kept getting people going to the Africa section because we organise all our books by country. So 
not just the travel guides about Africa, but memoirs set there or novels set there, they'd always go to Africa and they'd always get this West with the Night by Beryl Markham. And to the point that if someone then came in and said, do you, know, do you have a book of Western Night? I'd go instantly to the section. I knew exactly what it was. I was really intrigued by it. I was like, what's all the fuss about? What's this random book? You know, it had a terrible cover. It, you know. Anyway, I, um, I read it and it was amazing. Beryl Markham was the first woman aviatrix, I think that's how it's pronounced, in Kenya. She had this extraordinary childhood growing up with lions and warriors and riding these horses it was wild and beautifully written and it was a brilliant book and so I wanted a way of getting lots of people to read this book and as a bookseller you have a certain amount of ability to do that because people come in and talk to you and you say oh you know have you read this and you give them these books but somehow the book club was a way of getting all these people to read it and all these people to tell their friends about it and and that was really exciting so yes it's it's very much the undiscovered gems of literature i'd like to think yeah to start with i definitely tried to pick out some hampstead Heath books we did westward by stella gibbons which takes place on hampstead Heath, and one of my favorites which is all passion spent by vita satville west which oh my gosh if if anybody's listening just you just have to read it it's so good um about this 88 year old woman who decides it's not too late to find her room of her own and she moves to Hampstead which back then was you know not as smart as it is now and it was seen as sort of terribly bohemian and she goes for these frail little totters on the heath so yeah I did try and choose some Hampstead books and occasionally we do do books where there's a sort of element of walking or traveling or nature we did Nan Shepherd the Living Mountain which is beautiful we did Laurie Lee as I walked out one midsummer morning but the majority, I have to say, are actually novels because I've found that those seem to give the best discussion. Is there something about the process of walking that you think is important? Definitely. I find I have my best conversations when I'm walking. I don't know if it's because you're moving and so everything's sort of flowing around your body or it's the fact that you're looking ahead of you rather than face to face with someone and you're both looking at the same thing. And there's all the air and, and, you know, if there is a pause in the conversation, which of course there is, it's not awkward and uncomfortable like it is if you're in a cafe and, you know, it's, it's this sort of pregnant pause. When you're out, it's, you can just look at the trees or, you know, a dog running past and, and it just works. It works really, really well. And I think people love that walking element. I think you already talked about something where it didn't go very well but is there anything that particularly stands out for you as something that made a really good discussion book Someone at a Distance by Dorothy Whipple that's it's a great book it's published by Persephone Books it's quite thick but you just read it in a blur um, as I was listening to one of your podcasts where someone was talking about Beware of Pity it's another one we did it's a similar experience Beware of Pity is very blurry as well you just sort of inhale it I felt someone at a distance was the same and everyone loved that and came up with all sorts of bonkers theories for it. She had another one that was quite unusual was Brodeck's Report. That's by Philippe Claudel. Um, it's a really strange book um, set in this village in sort of on the edges of Germany, France. And it's just, it's in this kind of slightly mythical time, but it's all very much about the Holocaust. For me, it was like the ideal situation. You know, nobody had heard of this book. Everyone got it and everyone loved it and everyone wanted to sort of know more. And for me, that's what the book club's about. It's about getting these books that are really good into people's hands and and they might not otherwise have found them. And what happens when the weather is terrible? Do you just soldier on? Is it all very British? We've actually been incredibly lucky in however long it's been, five or six years, I think we've only had two days where it's really poured. I think if, yeah, if it's torrential rain, I don't know what we'll do, but, you know, we'll just sort of work it out, I think. And do you have any tips for anyone who maybe wanted to start a walking book club of their own? Yes, I do. I would say choose your route first, so you don't get lost. And along the route, earmark, I don't know, four or five places that are good to stop, you know, with a bench or a view or something like that. And I would say bear in mind that your walk with the Walking Book Club will, you know, if you're walking on your own, it would probably only take half an hour because you walk quite slow and you have lots of stops. So don't be too ambitious in your distance, but find a nice little loop. 
and choose a good book. Emily, thanks so much for talking to me about your walking book club. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for asking me about it. (laughs) Emily's walking book club sounds so fantastic. If it's been going for five years, I used to live right around the corner from that bookshop. I could have joined in. <laughs> I'm so sad I missed out. Well, you still can. And I think we should, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm dying to go. I think it would be uh, wonderful. I can't wait to go to one. There were so many amazing recommendations in there, some of which I have read. I've read Westwood by Stella Gibbons. Oh, you have? Yeah, because Stella Gibbons grew up, I think, in Kentish Town. And, uh. and I've also lived in Kentish Town, which is not that far away from the Heath. But uh, I've never read All Passion Spent by Vida Sackville West. And I've never read Someone at a Distance by Dorothy Whipple. Yeah, I thought it was funny about Vita Sequelbos because I've, I've read lots of things about her, but I've never actually read anything by her. I don't her. think I have and, either. Um, Emily obviously really rates her as a, as a writer. So yeah, I think that was the one I thought well, I should uh, read that. And West with the Night by Beryl Markham. I think my mum has told me about that, unless there are that many aviatrices, mm. aviatrixes mm. Um, out there. But it sounds great too. Mm, yeah, that, that also sounds like it might make a really good book club book. That would be the benefit of having a, a bookseller as your book club book chooser. Yeah, she's it's... great, wasn't she? She really knew her books. <laughs> I was very inspired by her. And I think there's something to be said for being a dictator about your book choices. Yeah. <laughs> I would want to read something that Emily had thought really carefully about and recommended. Especially when the, the, the members of the book club are changing from meeting to meeting because, you know, it's a gathering and people are walking with different people. I think that's a, you want to be sure that you're picking books that people are going to have a lot to latch on to yeah, to I find was... that common ground. I was really intrigued by that because I was wondering how it would work with different people coming every time. But obviously she's the consistent factor and she's just got this all this wonderful warmth and personality. And I could just see how she just holds the whole thing together like glue. The most astonishing thing about that interview was the fact that it has only rained on them twice (laughs) in five years. I'm not sure it rains in London as much as people think. I liked the idea of connecting people and that you could go to that book club and have really comfortable chats with people that you've never met before because of course you're all talking about the book and I actually thought it would be a wonderful way to to make friends Um, yeah I think great yeah and then to go to one of her book clubs and then wander into the fantastic dawn books and uh and buy something afterwards (laughs) sounds like a promotion for dawn books it doesn't need to do that but I think that's okay it would just be it would just be the perfect ending to a Sunday morning I think I think anyone visiting London who uh, is looking for a good bookshop um, should head to any of the Dawn bookstores though we, yeah. we can endorse them they're I wonderful think we can. <laughs> yeah they're all beautiful <laughs> I think she's really onto something as well making it a walking book club because she's right if you're meeting with strangers around a table in a wine bar you will have those pauses which are slightly awkward mm. whereas if you're walking with strangers but well, one you can get away from them if you don't want to talk to them anymore <laughs> <laughs> these are the things I think about but but two you know you're, you're moving around you have things to look at um, it's just you know you can fall in and out out of conversation. I think it's a really brilliant idea to bring together strangers to talk about books. What to read next is always one of our favourite things to think about. Inspired by the trouble with goats and sheep, here are a few more recommendations you might want to consider for your next book club. Indeed, they might be the recommendations rather than uh, the trouble with goats and sheep. Yeah, because I'm not sure we'd recommend the trouble with sheep. No, no, maybe not. Um, My recommendation is The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton. It won the Booker in 2013, so some of you may have heard of it already. Catton was only 28 years old when it won. And it might feel like an unlikely candidate to pair with The Trouble with Goats and Sheep because it's very different subject matter. It's set in a gold rush town in the 1860s in New Zealand. Um, But, but... Yeah, what is the connection? I'm very intrigued as to how you're going to make the link. Because we did um, the luminaries for oh, my book Oh, did you? Um, okay. We always read whichever one wins the booker. And so that year we read we read the luminaries. Okay. So how is that connected Let to me make my case. suburban England? It's not connected to suburban England, but the structure of the, the novel itself, I think, is somewhat similar. So when you, um, in the luminaries, someone has disappeared. And that is the impetus for us to go into uh, the backstories of of 12 men who have gathered. Mm. We also have an outsider narrator kind of linking together all these different perspectives. Walter Moody, who's just arrived in this gold rush town. And the disappearance is not the only focus of the novel, but it is a thread that unites all the different events and kind of wraps it up. Mm. It's it's a massive book. Mm. So it is 862 pages. That might be a bit much for some book groups. Mm. But there's so much to talk about. Mm. Um, yes, the disappearance. Yes, all the plot. But also there's this um, strange structure that yeah, has the, to do with astrology. The structure is fascinating. So yeah, 
Is, How was it as a book? Yeah. yeah. No, it was a, it was a, it was a good book club book. Brilliant. Okay, so try that one, guys. And I would recommend another book that we did for my book club a long time ago, which is If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things by John McGregor. Life on an everyday street somewhere in the north of England. A terrible accident has occurred. People are frozen, unable to react. And in that moment, the novel takes us out of time and shows us fragments from the events leading up to this one moment. We are offered a glimpse into people's lives behind closed doors, behind curtains. And from those everyday moments, we build up a picture of the characters. It was really interesting the way it was written. And I remember we had a very good, very good discussion about it. It made for a very good book club book. Ah, so this one is proven. Yeah, (laughs) it's tried and tested by my book club. One other recommendation I had in mind, we didn't talk about this earlier, but is To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. I I had this in mind too. I think it's because of the narrator. You've got the the child narrator trying to piece together the puzzle. Scout and Jem and Dill. You also have an outsider. Yeah. I I have to say, I think if you want to read a book with a child narrator piecing together a puzzle, definitely. Yeah. Read the classic. it's It's very unfair, isn't it, to kind of, you know criticize Joanna Cannon for not coming up to, you know, the standard of Harper Lee, but um to Killing Mockingbird. Yeah. Is um, a really is a really worthwhile read. And I haven't read that in ages, so I think even if you've read it, you know, when you were in your teens, because I think most people in North America read it for high school, it might well be time to go back and try it again. Yeah, I'm feeling quite inspired to do that. So that's our recommendations. But back to Emily Rhodes of the Walking Book Club for some from her. I would say Elizabeth Taylor, A View from the Harbour, which is a recent one we did, and it was great discussion. That's about a sort of seaside town and the sort of relations between the neighbours and who's having an affair with who and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Elizabeth Taylor is such a good writer and it's so well observed and, and it just gets that point between sort of crying and laughing all, all the time. And then I suppose other really hot books are quite good. You read Hot Milk, Deborah Levy. Oh, God, that's a great book. Um, I sort of wish it had won the booker. Um, That's a very good hot book. Ruma Goddens, very good Indian writer. She wrote a book called Breakfast with the Nicolaides. That's all very hot in India and quite quite kind of intense. And The Summer Book by Toby Janssen. It's wonderful about playing on an island. Um, in these kind of crazy Scandinavian summers. Is that a couple of... It's more. (laughs) It's more than I could have hoped for. Thank you. That's it for this episode of the Book Club Review. Next time, we'll be discussing my next book club book, The Prophets of Eternal Fjord, by Norwegian author Kim Lina. And if you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram at the Book Club Review. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? For now, thanks for listening and happy reading.